I'm dead last, so uh, thanks everybody for letting me stay between whatever it is that you're going to do once you leave this room to, uh, to, to sit through this. Um, I'm going to talk about what, um, what, what we've actually rebranded as a, as a company as of yesterday. Uh, we were formerly a company named Apex Labs, and um, we rebranded as a part of uh, a company taking a new identity as Upskill. So upscale has a, a very special meaning to what we're doing from a corporate mission perspective, because what, what, our, what our kind of overall mission statement is, is driving the, the industrial workforce um, to improve their skill sets across a variety of different things uh, in an industry 4.0 type of a landscape. And we do that with a concept that we call assisted reality, uh, which is a subset of uh, AR. So just a quick um, recap on to what the, what the shop floor, the industry 3.0, um, so industry 3.0 shop floor workforce looks like today. You're typically dealing with um, work instructions and other kinds of digital information that is present within the, the enterprise IT infrastructure. Um, all of that is you know, in ones and zeros. And most of the information that people need um, for a company like Newport News or from General Electric or Boeing to do their work resides in digital form somewhere within the digital enterprise. Where that transition takes over into the analog domain is when that information needs to be delivered to the technician or the operator that is actually doing the work. Typically what that means is um, that information is printed out and delivered as a set of manuals or work instructions that people are doing for the day, um, or it's being located at a workstation that's far away. The information has to get stored in the brain, which is analog, um, and then you go and do the work. And then at the end of that process, uh, you take the results that you've done, and then you have to go back to your terminal or whatever it is, or mark it down on your paper, and then you have to digital, you have to manually enter that data back into the digital system. So what that means is that in those two digital to analog and then back to digital transition points, you're creating potential um, inefficiencies and uh, margin for error. And with the Industry 4.0 um, initiatives that, that we're doing across a variety of different large enterprise customers that we're working with, that's what we're fundamentally trying to address with uh, smart glasses is to eliminate that transition point. So if you think about the technology readiness of um, most of the environments that we work with, again, you have um, digitized workflows that are generally readily available with IT caveats, you know, information security and other kinds of things like that is always important when you're dealing with uh, large enterprise systems. And you also have um, smart glasses that are available and at scale for what we call and what Gartner calls uh, glanceable experiences. So think about experiences that are more Google Glass-like rather than HoloLens-like. Uh, those are devices that, uh, that are shipping you know, at volume, at price points, and at quantities where it's uh, viable for many of, the, many of the businesses that are looking to go and deploy this um, enterprise-wide today. That combined with the fact that, at least in the head-worn space, there are hardware deficiencies that still exist um, that are pre precluding people from really having seamless augmented reality experiences means that when it's combined with these operational drivers of wanting to have the hands-free experience, whether or not that was uh, Newport News's example of you know, wanting to have hands-free experiences purely for safety reasons, whether or not you want to simply just have um, you know, waste elimination. So waste isn't necessarily scrap material as much as waste is um, wasted motion or wasted resources or wasted energy. Just a sheer act of you working here on a, on a certain task and then needing to walk back over here to be able to go and read whatever is on the, on the table. That's wasted motion. That's waste. And from the concept of uh, lean manufacturing and lean operations, being able to eliminate that back and forth, especially when that's a motion that's probably happening several thousand times a day when you are a Boeing or a General Electric or a Johnson & Johnson, that ends up turning into a tremendous amount of savings before you even introduce the concept of augmented reality into the picture. And that, that of course, describes the digital physical disconnect at the shaft floor, which is frankly where we live in the industry 3.0 world today. 
So the solution that, that we drive um, is, again, the concept called assisted reality. And it's, uh, it's the idea of being able to take the existing data that is there, use the, the hardware that is available at scale today, and then deliver that to the operator in a hands-free way. Of course, this isn't the, the be-all, end-all solution. You know, the augmented world is, as hopefully you, you got from all of the, the talks that are, that are here today, the augmented world is absolutely where um, everybody is trying to go, and we certainly want to take our customers there as well. But based on the, based on the business need to try and take the technology that's available today and then try and impact as many people as possible within the enterprise, we believe that this is the right way to go and do this. So let's talk about what we did at Boeing. Um, and Boeing called this uh, pro Project Juggernaut, which is an appropriate name given the, the sheer breadth of how this can really transform how they're doing the work um, using assisted reality within, within their enterprise. So the business need is obvious. You know, it's obvious for any of the organizations that's looking to deploy augmented reality technology, quality, productivity, and then knowledge transfer. And just to be able to share some of the metrics to understand how big of a deal wire harness assembly is, it's a pretty manual process because you can do a fair amount of automation to, to have certain areas of the subassembly be um, automatically done. The actual process of putting all of that together is still, it still requires a human in the loop. It's, it's high, highly variable and it is a, a high enough type of, um, high value enough of an asset that you really do need quality and you need redundancy. The last thing that you want is for one of those wires to fail when you're 35,000 feet in the air and something terrible happens. Um, 171 miles of wiring in a Boeing 747, 62 miles of wiring, I believe, in a Boeing 737. And then Boeing as a company has over 5,600 airplanes in, in the backlog. I actually went and uh, pulled this number from their most recent um, backlog figures. So being able to deliver air, airplanes as quickly as possible and on time is of paramount importance. And if this ends up holding up the process, this manual process ends up holding up delivery of the planes, then that's a direct hit to the, the Boeing company's bottom line. That combined with the fact that there is an interest in, in Boeing's part to, to drive up their production rate on a monthly basis while you know, staying as lean as possible, so using you know, existing resources plus some targeted investments to, to up, basically you're talking about um, improving or enhancing their production rate over the course of the next three years uh, by 30%, going from 42 airplanes uh, a month to 57. You can't just do that by telling people to work harder. You have to be able to, you have to, be able to clearly um, deliver some of the, the enablers that, that, that the human works, the industrial, the industrial workforce need in order for them to, to be able to actually reach their peak efficiency. So this is what we did. We took our, our software platform, Upskill's uh, software platform is called Skylight, um, and connected that to the, the existing data sources that Boeing has um, within their, their parts database as well as their product lifecycle management database, which has all of the, the information needed to go and put together a wire harness assembly. And we combined that with um, our implementation of a, a voice interface that enables them to go fully hands-free. Now, this isn't a, a Google Assistant or a Siri or an Alexa type of a speech interface as much as it is a, a very limited dictionary, command and controlled, and an offline embedded uh, speech interface, keeping things very, very simple and also taking away the, the need to go and hit a, a third-party cloud server to get voice processing back. So that had some information security um, implications as to why we deliberately took that, that path. And then what we enable being that Glass is also, this was done on uh, Google Glass. Um, what, uh, what we also enabled is the ability to use the built-in camera and the audio to allow capturing and sharing of um, first-person perspective of the work that's being done so that if there's a defect um, or if there's some sort of an anomaly, you're either able to call up uh, an expert or a supervisor to be able to get instant sign off or resolution of the issue that you're seeing. Or at the very, very minimum, if um, someone isn't available, you're able to capture the issue, record it, and then move on to your next task. 
As far as adoption goes, and, and again, this is something that we're very proud of, uh, being able to drive meaningful um, applications and meaningful deployments of uh, assisted reality uh, within Boeing. Uh, our, target, our, our target site was in Mesa, Arizona, which is um, uh, a combined commercial and uh, defense factory. And we targeted um, 400 wire harness technicians at that particular location. And as the, the initial metrics are starting to come through, how that scales is to 2,500 Boeing employees that are, that are doing wire harness assembly and then thousands more uh, down, down a supply chain through the subcontractors that are supplying wire harnesses across a variety of different airplanes that they're building. As that use case expands beyond wire harnesses to other manufacturing personas or other supply chain personas or maintenance and field service use cases, we estimate that 25% um, of the Boeing company's population is addressable using the technology that we have today. And what that translates to is 40,000 people. That's, and that's one company, huge number of people. You can't do that without having some close business metrics that are tied to it. And this is some of the earliest data that, uh, that was made public actually a, a number of months ago, is being able to drive 25% 25 reduction, 25 reduction in production time, and then being able to drive the error rate from 3% to effectively zero. So you're, not only are you doing things faster at the, at the micro task level in being able to build wire harnesses faster, but at the macro level, when you zoom out, by reducing rework to effectively zero, you've now cut back the total amount of time to go and build an aircraft by a huge amount of margin. This is why one of our sponsors uh, was actually on, on video with us, and that video is available at our, at our homepage at upskill.io. Um, wearables is what they're calling a step function change. This isn't an incremental change of productivity. This isn't something incremental that they're doing that, that moves the needle just a little bit. It really is a huge step function in, in human productivity. Of course, there are implementation challenges whenever this, uh, these kinds of things go on. Um, device man management and rollout on the IT side was the first one that we really ran into, where um, Boeing's IT security team basically you know, looked at these as an extension of their mobile device strategy and wanted to manage it within the same fabric that they, that they do their smartphones and tablets today. So what we went and did um, is uh, we integrated our, our platform with uh, AirWatch, which is their, um, their enterprise mobility management platform of choice. So rather than introducing a third party solution to be able to fill that capability or deliver that capability ourselves, we went and, and integrated and partnered with the existing vendor of choice that they were using so that there's zero overhead, zero additional overhead in uh, Boeing IT's uh, ability to go and, and manage this, um, this rollout and then support it uh, post the rollout. They're also very concerned because this market is still early. It's a, it's a market that's growing and starting to mature very, very quickly, but um, it is still an early market. So they were very concerned about technology and device lock-in. And this is actually one of the unique uh, value propositions that we deliver is that once you go and do the, the, the system integration associated with um, your data sources, you're able to go and use any, any number of devices that we support at the platform level, is zero effort, and then there's an element of future-proofing as new devices come into the market. We also provide support for that, and you're basically Boeing's investment into this integration and this, this investment is preserved as uh, technology continues to improve. And then, of course, data database access and IT security. Again, this is not so much of a, a technical problem, as it was said earlier, but it's more of a, a policy, and it's a security matter, where the architecture that we chose um, has a, a core server component that was integrated and installed within their enterprise network. And the subsequent use cases are, are done by what we call add-ins, effectively the, the event handlers and data connectors to their existing databases. So we were able to avoid repeated audits, repeated security audits, um, as, we were, as we were starting to sc scale use cases across different locations as well as different, use, uh, different applications. If you zoom out and 
look at kind of the entire aerospace product life, life cycle as an example of where this could go. Um, this is pretty, again, this is pretty powerful. So Boeing here is just one, mind you, very large manufacturer within this life, life cycle. But if you took those kinds of applications that are, that are pretty readily um, applicable towards uh, other companies' use cases, whether or not that's Lockheed Martin or Airbus or Embraer or what have you, and we work with some of them today, uh, you're able to now really drive the, the economy of scale to lower the, the overall system costs associated with it because as we grow larger and as we're able to go and build a, a larger organization around our capabilities, um, some of the, the cost savings are, are naturally going to be transferred to, to our customers. And then if you look at on the supplier side, um, you also have similar challenges in manufacturing, similar challenges in being able to to have to go and deliver high value, highly complex assemblies. So a lot of the Boeing use cases that are proven out at their corporate level often ends up being shared as a reference to um, their partners on the supplier side. And where a lot of this um, interesting thing comes in, and Ralph Taylor Smith of GE Ventures, who's one of our investors, mentioned this earlier, is that one of the killer apps of enterprise augmented reality is going to be in field service and telepresence. So MRO stands for maintenance, maintenance, repair, and overhaul um, operations of, uh, of the aerospace industry. So if you think about what that means from a field service perspective, and as, as I'm outlining here, it's a $63 billion expenditure in MRO and civil aviation today, um, nearly doubling to $100 billion by 2025, so nine years from now. If you're able to go and move the needle by cutting back on some of the waste again, whether or not that's wasted motion, wasted trip, and in this case, it, it could even be wasted materials, um, that's a game changer. Even if you had a 10% a impact on that bottom line, that's $10 billion in savings. And 10% is not an unreasonable number uh, to be able to drive when you introduce technology like this. So that's it. <laughs>